Uh, welcome and everyone to our town hall meeting for June 15th, 2023. So happy that you're able to take some time and join us this evening because we have an all-star lineup tonight of uh, folks who have been helping us with our efforts to push a national infrastructure bank through Congress. So um, thanks to everyone for being here this evening. And uh, we have a special treat uh, for everyone um, that we're gonna get to here in a minute. My name is Julie Olson. I'll be your moderator this evening. I'm um, from Alaska and I'm the chair of the Progressive Caucus for the Alaska Democrats. I'm also a small business owner and uh, feel that the National Infrastructure Bank would he be hugely important to other small business owners like me. So with that, why don't we get right to our meeting? And uh, the first thing we have is a video message from Representative Danny Davis, who is our main sponsor of the legislation in Congress. So Danny has uh, recorded this video for us. Hello, I'm U.S. Representative Congressman Danny Davis from the 7th Congressional District of Illinois. And as citizens of these great United States, we are all aware that our nation's investment on infrastructure has contracted, and many of our critical public systems are falling into disrepair. As a result, American manufacturing has declined. We are losing our worldwide competitive edge. The American Society of Engineers estimated in its 2021 report card that $6.1 trillion is needed just to repair our nation's infrastructure. Of that, $2.6 trillion is not financed by budgets leaving a large and growing financial gap. The areas of need are vast. They include roads, bridges, freight corridors, and mass transit. We need to fix electricity grids, dams, ports, and airports. We have to clean our drinking water from lead poisoning and other toxic chemicals. Nobody should have to drink lead-contaminated water, adult or child. This is unacceptable. We need broadband everywhere and millions of new units of affordable housing to finally end homelessness and housing insecurity. We need 7 million new units of affordable housing to end homelessness and the housing crisis. We must bring water into the parched regions of the Southwest. We need long-term projects to bring water into the Colorado River Basin. This is where we grow much of the nation's food supply. It will cost at least $5 trillion that is needed over a 10-year period to do this. To our credit, Congress passed the Hallmark Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act in 2021. I was in the middle of that. It was a great beginning. However, it needed to provide more investments in our economy to cover the list of projects I just outlined. Therefore, we need to build on that great start. Unfortunately, Republicans are more focused on messaging on initiatives that are meaningless and not effective, and budget cutting than building the nation. Bank lending is down, and Congress has agreed to put a cap on new spending. Ladies and gentlemen, and young folks, building our nation is not spending. It is investing, investing in our country, investing in our future to solve problems, create innovation, grow technology and industry, 
and sustain our economy for many years to come. And that's why we need to return to our historical model of financing public infrastructure using a national bank. We had several successful national banks in our nation's past, starting just after the American Revolutionary War and extending through Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Reconstruction Finance Corporation. The Reconstruction Finance Corporation, along with other sound initiatives, helped to get us out of the Great Depression, build up manufacturing, and won World War II. It made Chicago a manufacturing and railroad center of the country. We need to use proven models and creative solutions to overcome our present and future challenges. For these reasons, I have reintroduced the bill, H.R. 4052, the National Infrastructure Bank Act of 2023. This National Infrastructure Bank would complement budgets. It would capitalize existing Treasury financial instruments held by the private sector, exchanged for preferred stock. The National Infrastructure Bank will be self-sufficient, stand on its own two legs, and will require no new spending taxes or deficit from the federal budget. It will pay family sustaining prevailing wages and create millions of new jobs. This will uplift the poor and middle class, just what was done to end the Great Depression. I'm very grateful to all of you for building support for this legislation. The grassroots have always carried the nation to its greatest achievements. It is precisely this kind of grassroots effort that can move the Congress to do the right thing. And together we shall. Thank you. Wow. Wow, what a great sum summation of the legislation from Danny Davis. He is our prime sponsor in Congress for this legislation, and he just made a very forceful argument and in laying out the benefits of this legislation for the entire country. So uh, what, what a, a thrill to listen to him and a pleasure to have him um, provide that video for us this evening. And now what I want to do is turn to uh, the rest of our all-star team of National Infrastructure Bank champions that we have assembled here this evening. And so we've got quite a list, um, but these are folks from around the country that have been working very hard to push this legislation in their areas of the country. So we are gonna move right through this list um, and we are gonna start with a brief presentation from Alfeka Mutardi, a former senior economist with the International Monetary Fund and now the chief economist for the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. Alfeka? Uh, thank you very much, Julie, and welcome to all of you. Thank you very much for joining us on this really important Zoom call tonight. We have a whole host of great speakers, so I'm gonna try and be as brief as possible. What I wanna do is Give you a quick update on the bill on um, just complementing what congressman davis said a quick update on the economy and then i want to address a question that we've had from people that we've talked to around the country uh concerning how the national infrastructure bank works and how it can pay back uh, all of its loans so uh to that end i am going to uh start with the bill here it is hr 4052 is the new bill number and the way that we'll change all of our resolution statements and uh, letters that are going out right now is to refer to the new bill number and then say that it is formally HR 3339. 
uh, again, what this bill does, of course, is create a $5 trillion public bank to finance infrastructure projects all across the country. And we're so excited uh, that the bill's been dropped. And now we're going back to all of our members of Congress to see if we can bring on some new co-sponsors for this bill. So that's where we are. Now, on the economy, where are we on the economy? Uh, things are still looking pretty shaky. Uh, we uh, have had very slow uh, GDP growth uh, in the first quarter of the uh, 2023. It, it fell down from the previous quarter, two quarters before that. But even of greater concern is the fact that another indicator, gross domestic income, actually fell for two quarters. These two uh, measures are supposed to equal each other because what one person produces another person earns as income to have to have made it. Uh, but unfortunately, income is not is declining. And the reason for that is our productivity is taking a nosedive. Productivity means is measured by the output per unit of input of labor. And it means that we're working longer hours, but we're not producing anymore. And we need to produce more to bring inflation down and grow the economy. So our National Infrastructure Bank will absolutely help to raise productivity. Our labor markets remain tight. We still had 10 million job openings uh, in April. We're twice the number of job seekers. Uh, most of the missing workers are back on the job. Uh, but however, they're employed in very low paying service jobs. And so they're not able to make ends meet. However, uh, core inflation, core CPI inflation is still stuck at around 5% uh, through April. And that is two and a half times higher than the Fed's target of 2%. Uh, gasoline prices are down, but rental contracts are rolling over at a second 6% increase year on year. All of that means that uh, the Fed will want to keep its eye on this number, this 5% number to figure out what it's going to do in the future about uh, interest rate increases. On Wednesday, the Fed decided to keep the Fed uh, federal funds rate uh, at its current level in June at five to five, five and a quarter percent. Uh, but it already uh, telegraphed that it may have two further uh, quarter percent rate hikes uh, this year in 2023. Uh, which will which will be up to near six percent interest rates uh, by the end of the year, and the de banking system is not doing well. The deposits are still draining out as depositors are looking for higher yield at this five or six percent yield that they, if they can get us outside the banking system. And at the same time, the Fed is continuing to tighten the money supply that drains out liquidity from the system. And the Treasury, now that the debt deal is agreed to, are sucking deposits out everywhere. So um, an interest rate on the national debt is exploding because of interest rates. The stock market is out of alignment. Tech stocks are shooting up uh, way outside of what they're actually profitable at. But we could see shorts setting up to crush the whole thing. And if that happens, then there could be a very fast downward movement in the stock market. And then the simultaneous withdrawal of fiscal and monetary surplus, tighter bank credit, all those things point to and bake in a recession. Uh, unfortunately, we will not be able to dig our way out of a recession like we have in recessions in the past because of the debt deal. And that means there is no plan B for the economy other than our National Infrastructure Bank. So this addresses a question that we've heard when we, we spent a lot the, the last five months trying to talk to members of Congress, especially Republican legislators, to see if we could bring them on board and get them to sign on to the National Infrastructure Bank. We, we've made tens of scores and scores of calls to them. We have interest. Nobody wants to be the first one to step in. But one of the questions that the, these offices asked us is, really, can, can you give out $5 trillion in loans? And can these states and local governments really pay back all these loans? And the answer is absolutely yes. And I'm going to step you through why I think so. First of all, here, this is what state and local government revenues look like. This blue line right here is the line for state revenues. And you can see that every time we have a recession, these gray areas, state revenues fall uh, very precipitously. And when we come out of a recession, they recover. Uh, for, in the case of local revenues, this orange line, 
they tend to go down when we have a crush in real estate values, uh, as happened with the housing market in 2008, and then happened because of COVID when everybody was staying home and uh, office worker uh, office uh, space uh, was not utilized. So uh, that's what we know of. But what the bigger picture is that when we have much higher growth, you can see that we'll have much more revenues coming into these state and local coffers. When we have much more uh, property development, uh, that will also bring up the values and bring in receipts into local governments. Uh, and I wanted to point out also one more thing is that coming out of the COVID recession, there was a huge pickup in the revenues of state governments. Why? Because the federal government was giving them money. Uh, it was a one-time deal to get them out of COVID. Uh, they sometimes misspent it. Sometimes they gave it away in tax increases. Uh, this was a one-time. They shouldn't have done it for a long-term thing like a tax uh, uh, decrease, uh, sorry. Uh, and then uh, they also lost value on their real estate too. So uh, we want to really, uh, the secret of the National Infrastructure Bank is that we'll, it will really raise economic growth and bring in new tax receipts that allow these state and local governments to repay back the loans. Let me give you two examples of how it worked in the past. First of all, uh, during the Great Depression, there were several agencies that were started uh, to hire up unemployed workers and see if we could get the economy back on track. One of them was the previous bank, like our National Infrastructure Bank. It was called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. It was a government financial corporation uh, started under its own act. It gave out a billion in aid to local governments, recapitalized banks, and lent for infrastructure projects. It was capitalized from a small budget appropriation. Keep in mind that during the Great Depression, like today, there was no money in the budget. And that's why we needed this set aside financial institution and uh, financed itself by selling bonds. And then another agency that came along to work together with the RFC was something called the Public Works Administration. It was created as part of the New Deal. Uh, it lent for large scale water uh, public works construction under the Department of Interior. It was fund it, uh, funded and managed, directly managed, 34,000 projects all across the country, including airports like LAX, dams like Hoover Dam, bridges like the Triborough Bridge in New York, uh, the Upper Mississippi River uh, locks and dam system that is used to bring cargo down the Mississippi River to the Port of New Orleans. 70% uh, in 70% uh, of the schools were funded by this mechanism and one third of hospitals. It gave out 70% in loans at very good uh, terms for the borrowers and 30% in grants. So it was using the loan interest rate to subsidize the grants because it was not getting money from the budget. As a result of the operations of these two groups of institutions, GDP growth exploded. Uh, it averaged 5% per year over the period of the RFC, 1933 to 57, productivity rose to three and a half percent per year, and the standard of living of everybody rose dramatically. So it really shows every dollar you in borrow and invest in infrastructure can be repaid back, and it will really fundamentally increase economic growth. Same thing for the rural electrification program. This is my favorite picture of a couple of guys, staff members from the uh, Rural Electrification Administration, teaching people how to use elect electric stoves with their aprons on and everything. Uh, it uh, Before it started its operations, only two in 10 farms in the United States had electricity. Uh, it was set up by executive order, lent a billion dollars, mostly to electric cooperatives, which the lawyers helped to set up in the first place at a very low interest rate, 3%, which was the treasury bond at the time, long maturities. Um, the delinquency rate was less than 1%. Uh, all of these pro projects were self-liquidating. That means that they earned uh, um, revenues coming in to repay back the loans. They did all kinds of really neat things like uh, hiring poor farmers, paying them in kind to electrify their house for $10. Uh, their competition with private electric companies forced uh, down the prices of electricity for everyone. They developed new assembly line techniques that lowered the cost of doing the installations. Look at this, it went from $2,000 per mile in 1933 down to $825 in 1939. 
again, productivity rose. Uh, the farm, the uh, average farm productivity uh, enhanced by a, a factor of four. They were able to start new uh, uh, lines of um, products like dairy farming and uh, 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 poultry farming. Uh, they cut the, the time for chores on farms in half. Uh, indoor plumbing saved on hauling water, scrubbing sanitation, refrigeration, all those kinds of things really improve the standard of living. So not only uh, was everything paid back, but it grew the economy and lifted up the average person. Our reconstruction finance, our National Infrastructure Bank can do the very same thing. Thanks very much. Thank you, Alfeca, for that presentation. It really struck home for me because actually one of my dad's first jobs was selling electricity to rural farmers in Wisconsin. And I know it's really kind of a hard concept to believe that that was his job, <clears throat> was to go out from farm to farm and convince these farmers to get off of kerosene and go with this newfangled thing called electricity. <clears throat> so anyway, so um, uh, um, that was my, the start of my dad's career. So thank you so much for putting that in, in your presentation. And uh, now we're gonna go in with another one of our superstars. And we are so fortunate to have with us tonight, uh, Ellen Brown, she is the chair of the Public Banking Institute. And we've seen a great resurgence of interest in public banking across the country. So we're gonna turn it over to Ellen. The uh, electricity story really strikes home with me too, because I remember my mother talking about, she lived on a farm and she she was there when it, they when they transitioned into electric, electric lights, which was quite remarkable at the time. Okay, so um, the stock market is way up today and the general consensus in the news is that the heat is off and that everything's okay. But as Elfeka points out, it's far from okay. Um, inflation has dropped and therefore the Fed has paused. They say paused, but they, didn't, they, aren't, they aren't saying that they're reversing the hikes and the damage has already been done. A lot of damage has been done from these very high hikes and that they're hinting that they could raise them even more. Um, Powell said that um, core inflation has not really moved down and it's not reacted much to our rate hikes. We're going to have to keep at it. So he's hinting that it's going up. Um, the debt ceiling crisis is paused also, but it's still there. It got kicked kick down the road to pass the next presidential election. So the next president is gonna have his hands full for sure. I can't even see what's in the bottom there. <laughs> oh yeah, oh, the banking crisis supposedly, you, you know, it's in abeyance and everybody thinks it's okay, but it's obviously not for reasons that I'll go into as soon as I find my page down thing. Um, but so the money supply is shrinking. U.S. money supply is falling at the fastest rate since the 1930s, which we know what that was. That's a depression. That's called a depression when the money supply shrinks so much that you don't have the money to fund your your um, infrastructure or your you know product productivity. Uh, M2 year over year is down 4.6 percent. The Fed is still selling off, it's still engaging in quantitative easing, selling off assets, which means it's shrinking the money supply. And the banks are afraid to lend because they're worried about bank runs. They're losing their deposits, as Elfeka points out, to the treasuries and the money market funds. The new treasuries are going to be coming out with nice high interest rates, and the banks can't afford that. They can't afford to pay 4.5% and still make profitable loans. Um, and the higher interest rates are putting affordable loans out of reach. So we have a run of bank runs. We've seen hotels go bankrupt and uh, commercial real estate is in serious trouble at the moment, um, malls and stores. And why, why? It's because the banks aren't lending according to experts. <laughs> Homelessness is at all time highs. Uh, we're not getting new federal infrastructure allocations, and we still have critical needs in affordable housing, water, power, the electric grid, public transport, roads, and bridges. Um, for example, we just saw an example in this last week when we had this major bridge collapse in Philadelphia in the I-95, which apparently was actually structurally sound. This is not one of those bridges that was in need of repair, but the problem was it's the only thoroughfare through the city. 
um, so it takes 160,000 vehicles per day, including 12,800 commercial vehicle trucks. So that's going to be a serious block in um, the supply chain until they manage to come out with some sort of alternative repairs expected to take months. So we need alternative arteries. Uh, I know Alfalca was talking about where she lives. <laughs> There's a similar problem. We need that all over the country where you have tra traffic jams. And if one of those major arteries goes out, we're in serious trouble. And we need more mass transit, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, so where do we find the money? We've uh, we've actually dealt with this sort of crisis before. In fact, we came into the into our existence as a country with a forty-four million dollar debt that Alexander Hamilton, the first Treasury Secretary, had to deal with. And what he did was he turned the debt into capital and used it to capitalize the first bank of the United States. And you could you could. Um, the debt was accepted in partial payment for stock in the bank. So then the bank could leverage that capital to at 10 to one, which is what you know banks typically do. So, so they could create 10 times as much credit as they had capital. And at that time, of course, they didn't create loans just by writing them into the de your deposit account that they, they printed out paper money. <laughs> that was So this was the beginning of our first um, official US currency. Uh, and under Hamilton's system of public credit, this money was not used for private profit as it was, you know, this spec, this money that was created on money. Uh, in Under the British system, it was privatized, used for private profit, but in speculation. But in the U.S., under Hamilton's system, it was for government and private interests to, uh, for internal improvements and other economic development. So with that and the second U.S. bank, we um, built quite a bit of um, productive things, including the Erie Canal, which was pretty impressive uh, achievement for those times. Um, but Jackson shut that. President Jackson shut the second U.S. bank down. So when L Lincoln came into office. He was faced with a civil war and the prospect of having to pay between 24 and 36 percent interest to uh, British bank backed bankers, which obviously would leave us in serious debt forever. Um, so instead, he, he resort, reverted to the system of the American colonists, the American system, which was he issued paper greenbacks, actually doubling the money supply. And his government founded the national bank system, which uh, was another system in which um, government debt was used to capitalize the banks. So the national banks, in order to become national banks rather than state banks, um, they had to capitalize their bank notes with government debt. And with that new funding, not only did the North win the uh, Civil War, but the, they funded a great deal of economic development. The most uh, well-known and impressive was the Transcontinental Railroad, which connected both lines of the country, sides of the country um, by 1869 and actually turned a profit for the government. Telegraph systems were developed, railroad track expanded, uh, factory output boom due to this increase in transportation and uh, mechanization allowed agriculture to flourish despite we, one million men being under arms. And for all that, now you can't see this chart, unfortunately, next time I'll try. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, all that, it was not inflationary. I know that's controversial, but I won't try to go into it. But even Milton Friedman said it was the printing of the money was not if uh, did not create price inflation, and the reason was that productivity supply went up with demand as under Roosevelt's bank. So then we and then in the 1930s we were dealt facing a situation that's even similar to but even worse than what we're dealing with right now, where the uh, the banks were bankrupt. I mean ours are just on the verge of bankruptcy and afraid to lend, but then the banks couldn't lend because. They didn't they were actually literally bankrupt and so the reconstruction finance corporation was set up under hoover to support to save the banks but it was repurposed under roosevelt to um, rebuild the economy and to fund our participation in world war ii so um, 
It started with a modest $500 million in capitalization and it issued bonds. And over the next 25 years, it managed to lend or invest over $40 billion and um, it returned a net profit to the government. So we need to do something similar. This is off budget financing, which could fund programs without legislative approval and without counting toward budget expenditures. You can see that better. <laughs> Um, so, unlike the RFC, the National Infrastructure Bank will be a depository bank, which means it can leverage um, loans at 10 times capital, and cities can repay these low interest loans with revenue bonds funded by the infrastructure they create, which is what was done in the 1930s. In other words, you fund it with the productivity that is created by the loan. So, like Washington, Lincoln, and FDR, we can turn debt into equity. Uh, for infrastructure and development and create a 21st century renaissance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, great presentation. Um, now we are going to go right to an another one of our uh, folks on the line. And with us this evening, we have um, from Limerick Township, Pennsylvania, Representative Joe Cerisi. Joe, can you tell us um, some of the, the things that are going on there in Pennsylvania with the uh, infrastructure? Yeah, just pulled it completely. We're driving in New York State, so forgive me. We're in the mountains, so if you can't hear me, that's why we just pulled over the side of the road quickly. So you already seen that we had the bridge collapse in Philadelphia um, due to a, a tanker truck explosion. And the one good thing is that we've proven in the state of Pennsylvania that we are able to do projects quickly. We've already um, demolished the bridge; both sides are down, and they're underway to build a new. Uh, Bridge over I-95. Um, our governor, Governor Shapiro, has dedicated every resource he possibly can because this is a critical part of our infrastructure. I don't know if you followed any of that news lately. So far, so good. But in within like uh, I guess within about 48 hours, they had one side of the bridge down, and the other 24 hours, the other side was going down uh, and, and, and ready to go. And we're starting new technology to rebuild the bridge. Um, we are doing well in Pennsylvania. We have a surplus of over $12 billion. That being said, we are putting about $6 billion into the rainy day fund and then starting to look at reinvesting into our um, infrastructure. There is a different majority in the House. The Democrats are a majority by a whopping one vote. Um, and that has been interesting to be in the majority party um, and also by one vote. The Senate still is a Republican held Senate, so um, we have to work with the Senate. Our governor is, of course, a Democrat also. Um, we are looking at putting infrastructure into our schools. Our schools are collapsing in certain areas in the cities of Philadelphia in particular, uh, and we're moving forward with trying to rebuild some of the schools. And we're talking more about our, our water lines, our pipelines. As a matter of fact, we just went through a massive project in my township, which is Limerick, with all new water pipes because the pipes were 60 and 70 years old and they needed to be replaced. So we're starting to put more money into those projects. The issue we have is, you know, like you brought up already, some of the federal money has not been released. Um, and we need that money to be able to do some of these bigger projects. I have been uh, trying to restore the commuter rail. And as I say to everyone, there's no one on this call who does not know the train that once serviced my community. If you've ever played Monopoly, you've all wanted that piece. It's the Reading Railroad. Um, we have put in for the FRA to try and see if we can get the Reading Railroad back. And so far, so good. We're on a timeline that may look like we're restored. Um, we're seeing the rail possibly be restored in Scranton. Um, of course, the hometown of President Biden. So that doesn't hurt. Uh, but we are trying to move and we're this resolution will run in the House, hopefully in the next couple of months. I, I'd like to see it run tomorrow, but um, nothing moves fast but we're being told that it's going to run. So I hope I gave you a good overview of what we have going on in Pennsylvania. Um, I'm sorry that it may be a little choppy. That is another reason for what we need. We have invested in broadband in Pennsylvania. Um, New York may be have to do it where we are right now, but we're really rural where we are in New York state right now. So I can't imagine if the signal is still coming through fully. We're heading up to Oneana. I think the last time I was on this call, I was heading to New York too. Okay. 
Oh, it's delayed. Yeah. Did you hear me? Maybe out of cell phone. No. It's right, it's I'll another try. reason why we need to broadband around the country. Exactly. More so than ever. <laughs> well, thank That's you right. all. We're we're with you here in Pennsylvania. We want to see this done. So keep in touch with us. I may drop off, but um, I'll get on another call for another time. But thank you. Thank, thank you, Representative Cerisi. Really appreciate all the work that you're doing there in Pennsylvania to uh, raise awareness of the National Infrastructure Bank. Next, I would like to go to the other side of the country where um, we have someone who's been instrumental in his state in getting the legislature and representatives on board backing this legislation. They face um, many um, uh, issues there, national resource types of issues that could be addressed with uh, funding from a national infrastructure bank. So I am honored to present Senator Bill Tallman from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Well, um, I'm not sure if he's going to be able to get his audio issues resolved, but I do want to say that he has worked long and hard in New Mexico and has a great team of folks there who are working hard to forward the legislation for a national infrastructure bank. Uh, New Mexico has some very serious uh, water issues, drought issues, and um, uh, a huge need for additional infrastructure bank investment there. Uh, now, if we can get, um, if he can get his audio back on, we'll come back to Senator Tallman later. And so now what I'd like to do is I would like to go to uh, the middle of the country. We have with us Representative Michelle Grimm from Toledo, Ohio. Hello. Michelle, yep. here we go. I'm right here. Hi, how are you? All right. So, um, so yeah, I'm uh, Representative Michelle Grimm. I um, represent um, my district is part of uh, Toledo and uh, a little a little village called Ottawa Hills. Um, so, uh, um, but um, yeah, so I'm I'm uh, joint sponsoring this with um, also Representative Brennan, who is from Parma, Ohio, and. Um, we uh, were newer to this. I know that there's been several folks who um, have uh, done these resolutions um, for several years now, but um, Representative Brennan and I are newer to this because we're newer to the legislature. We just got um, elected last November. And um, so we're, you know, like many other states, we're in our budget season, uh, the Senate gutted affordable housing. Um, and, you know, I, I think it would be really helpful to empower local governments uh, with a national infrastructure bank to um, invest in affordable housing and invest in uh, other infrastructure. Um, we, uh, a few years ago, the city of Toledo passed a, uh, a road tax, a one quarter road tax, and even with that road tax, before that road tax, it would take a hundred years to repair all of our streets. Now it takes 30 years. So that's still quite a lot, quite a lot of time. So something like a national infrastructure bank where we can, you know, take out a loan to help um, repair our streets would be very helpful. And then you know, in the city, there's several different bridge projects going on at the same time. So depending where you are you have to dodge one part of the city or another. So there's really a lot going on and that would be really helpful, um, you know, for our city and the, and the rest of the state. So, um, so yeah, there's just so tremendous opportunity with a national infrastructure bank. Another thing that we're exploring is Amtrak. Uh, the, the governor decided to um, apply for a study to expand Amtrak. Um, one of those routes is Cleveland to um, Columbus to Cincinnati to Dayton. And then another one is Toledo, uh, Cleveland, Toledo, Detroit. So that, you know, that's another uh, really important thing for our state. And um, I think it depends on what the study says, do we move forward? And we, again, with a national infrastructure bank, we have the infrastructure, you know, we can, we can build upon that. We have a really nice Amtrak station and, you know, we can partner with local governments like that. If there is a national infrastructure bank to 
make sure that, that those projects happen. And what we're not really talking about, unfortunately, and I think we need to, is Toledo to Columbus, because we don't have a, a, a train from Toledo to Columbus, because we don't have a direct route right now um, with the interstate um, from Toledo to Columbus. That's a, that's a big thing. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of local folks are looking for a, a bypass there, but I also think we need to look at at passenger rail. So, so, you know, those projects would be really helpful with the National Infrastructure Bank. And um, again, like other people are saying, uh, our lead pipes, um, the city is using our ARPA dollars to, to um, replace all the private lead pipes. But, you know, other places that can't do that, they can use the, these funds municipal broadband. Um, I wish that was something we explored with our ARPA dollars, but did not. So I think, you know, this was kind of a no brainer for me to hop on board. Um, there's a lot of local support and I see a few local folks on this call. So that's wonderful. So that's kind of what's going on in our state and how the National Infrastructure Bank would, would really help Ohio. Thanks, Michelle. Really appreciate your work on that. And, and I think we've had Representative Brennan on um, a, a few of our calls as well. So we really appreciate the two of you uh, supporting the Infrastructure Bank. Um, I want to let everybody know that we're going to have questions and answers at the end. And we do actually have an Amtrak uh, expert here on the phone. And so would love to have some conversation of, about the need for high speed rail and improving our transportation uh, grid. Um, with rail. Uh, okay, so now let's move on to our next speaker. And uh, from the Pacific Northwest, Anacortes, Washington, we have with us Senator Liz Lovelett uh, from Anacortes, Washington. Hi there, everybody. Uh, my name is Liz Lovelett. Uh, I live in the heart of the Salish Sea uh, near the San Juan Islands in Washington State. Uh, and I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, Senate Joint Memorial 8001, spon sponsored by longtime uh, state bank advocate, Senator Bob Hasegawa. Uh, you know, here in Washington, we're talking about infrastructure from uh, every level of governance. You know, we see needs, we see gaps in services, we see how our communities are trying to grow in a way that is really thoughtful about the way that we match up our housing with our transit options so that we can preserve our open spaces and make sure that we can maintain this quality of life. And so I see this from uh, having been a city council member who is in charge of a fairly large uh, municipal water system, uh, thinking about all the challenges we have in delivering uh, proper roads, uh, let alone bus service in a county like I'm in that's pretty rural, uh, where you know you really have to subsidize a transit agency. Uh, additionally, in Washington State, we have a tremendous obligation. Uh, we have been uh, litigated by our sovereign nations around uh, remediating our culverts uh, throughout Washington State uh, for the benefit of salmon restoration, water conveyance, you know, we're seeing a lot of floods. I think the confluence right now between this relationship of how we manage to provide affordable, dignified housing for people, the way we look into the future where climate change is uncertain and it's pressing our infrastructure to its absolute limits. And then you add in the perfect storm of deferred maintenance uh, on, on our roads, on our bridges, uh, all of these places that we that we use to get from here to there, not only as individual citizens, but uh, the, the backbone of our commerce you really see this relationship with how we have to be able to deploy infrastructure at every level of governance. So uh, I was really pleased this year when we were able to not only sponsor uh, Senate Joint Memorial 8001 to talk about the importance of the National Infrastructure Bank, but also to get it all the way to the governor's desk. So, you know, we went through a lot of uh, motion to get it there. Um, it, it did come out on partisan lines. You know, it's one of those interesting things that you never know how the politics are going to go. Um, I'm a democratic socialist and I do almost exclusively bipartisan work around infrastructure, around climate change. Um, and that's because I think people are really interested in seeing how we can create the communities of the future that are going to be necessary to rise to the challenge that climate change is presenting to us, that is rising the challenge of, of population growth, of job insecurity, of food insecurity. Uh, you know, we have a lot of really interesting issues in Washington state. Uh, we're trying to create templates that are replicable across the United States. I'm on the team for the Washington State Public Infrastructure Bank so we can take care of some of our state uh, transportation and infrastructure needs. 
Uh, but I see this National Infrastructure Bank as being a natural complement to the way that we're able to deliver mega projects that can create that connectivity uh, from coast to coast, from north to south, that we can really get our, our students to universities across the country, that we can get the R&D going across our country because we're connecting our people, we're connecting our, our communities. Um, and that flow of ideas, that flow of, of economic mobility, that all happens when you have infrastructure because it's not just the jobs that you create by creating the infrastructure. It's, it's the humanity and the social cohesiveness that you create when you have people uh, coming together in, in incredible ways. And I think broadband is one of the most salient examples. I, I think the way that we uh, work to create a new energy future uh, or in, in you know, from coast to coast. We've got a lot of big problems, uh, a lot of challenges in our communities, but at the end of the day, um, I chair the Local Government Land Use and Tribal Affairs Committee for uh, the Washington State Senate Democrats. And what I hear back again and again is infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. And it doesn't matter if you're, you know, just trying to get one small sewer line in one small town, or if you're trying to get high-speed rail that's going to take you uh, from Washington, D.C. to Washington State, the needs are big and small. Uh, we need all hands on deck. And I see the National Infrastructure Bank as a natural solution to avoiding partisan arm wrestling over appropriations that go into projects, right? Like we all hate this idea of like pork or that we're like bringing home spending or whatever, but what that really means is that we're getting infrastructure dollars. So what if we just had this way that self-generated and was able to provide infrastructure in a non-politicized environment? And to me, that's one of the most salient reasons for continuing to pursue this endeavor. Uh, I wanna make sure that we can deliver for the people in our communities, the infrastructure that they deserve that provides clean drinking water that provides proper sewer treatment, uh, you know, all of those pieces that we take for granted until that time where you turn on the tap and your water doesn't turn on, or that time that you try to flush the toilet and it doesn't go anywhere, like that's when all of a sudden you notice like, oh boy, my infrastructure is incredibly important, right? The lights don't turn on. Uh, let's get ahead of that. We're, we're seeing issues in the supply chain all across the country. And I, I just see this as being an elegant solution to a collective problem that we can look at regardless of political stripe. So hope you guys are out here to support and make sure that you're challenging your local leaders to think big uh, as we move forward on this endeavor. So glad to be here with you all tonight. Thank you so much, Senator. That was a, a great, um, um, a great uh, call to everyone to, to join in and help us move this legislation forward. I do wanna say that on a, on a regular basis, weekly, probably daily basis, uh, the group, the coalition is reaching out to uh, legislators, members of Congress of all stripes, of all political persuasions, because as you were saying, uh, roads and bridges are not partisan, right? That, you know, Republicans and Democrats and independents all drive on uh, that, across that bridge that collapsed in Philadelphia. So really we need to put aside the, those labels and really just get down to doing the important work of government. And, and it's one of the, the important functions of government is public infrastructure. That's where we should be. So um, we really wanna urge everybody on the call to join us in contacting your local legislator, regardless of what party they're in, that really shouldn't have any bearing on this. Uh, so thank you again for being here. We really appreciate it. And Senator Tallman. Good evening, everyone. It's uh, Bill Tallman, state senator from um, from uh, New Mexico. Uh, New Mexico is, uh, believe it or not, part of the United States. A lot of people on the East Coast uh, don't realize that. So I want to bring you up to date on some of the stuff we're doing here in, uh, in Albuquerque, in uh, New Mexico. We're doing a lot. Um, the latest uh, development is I'm sponsoring a resolution at the uh, NCSL convention in, in Indianapolis to be held from August 14th to 16th that will be uh, presented to the Infrastructure and Transportation Committee. And uh, if there's anyone out there that's gonna attend the NCSL in August, I certainly would uh, welcome your, your presence and support at the, uh, at the committee meeting um, to be held. I'm not sure what they see, they're gonna be the 14th, 15th, or 16th, but they always have detailed uh, um, agendas that are readily available. So that's uh, obviously a resolution urging uh, Congress to um, implement and enact the uh, National Infrastructure Bank legislation. 
Uh, here and out, we have uh, three uh, Congress persons from New Mexico, and two of them have uh, signed on to the bill. And the third one, uh, we're, we're confident that we're going to get uh, his support uh, within the next uh, few months. So, also, we're uh, I've we've uh, I've uh, written and. The largest newspaper in the state has uh, published several uh, op-eds um, praising the the benefits of the National Infrastructure Bank. Uh, we've had uh, two uh, that were specifically geared to the National Infrastructure Bank, and we had a third one on uh, dealing specifically with water infrastructure. So I've participated in, in over the last couple of years on uh, at least a couple of dozen um, Zoom meetings, and um, I've uh, we we've every year the uh, Hispanic um, ranchers and farmers have a convention here in Albuquerque, and um, I've served on a panel um, praising and explaining the National Infrastructure Bank. And um, last year there was. Uh, the City Council of State Governments held a national convention in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I uh, had an opportunity to speak in favor of the National Infrastructure Bank and um, and sing the praises and uh, answer questions in a, a committee meeting that was uh, very well attended. And we got a lot and signed up a lot of people that uh, at that meeting that uh, came up and had a lot of questions and said that they were interested, very interested in the concept. So, um, we're, like I said, we've been very active here in um, in New Mexico. Um, so, high-speed rail. I'm going to Europe this summer, looking forward to riding the high-speed rail. I've been to China twice in the last 20 years. China's got 25,000 miles of high-speed rail. Europe's got 15,000. United States got nothing. That's probably because in China, they don't have to deal with a recalcitrant Congress. The dictators just decide we're going to do it. And in Europe, they have an entirely different attitude. In Europe, invest infrastructure is a, is a uh, investment. In the United States, it's an expense. We, um, we hate to spend money in this country, even on this. And um, probably the most selfish, greedy country in the world, and the money talks, and money is everything. And unfortunately, we have to get past that or we're going to be doomed. The, as we all know, the infrastructure bill that Biden passed, uh, signed in uh, November of 21, was far short of what is needed. In fact, the need is the need is five to six billion, trillion. And we only got a trillion, but actually there's only half a trillion in uh, new money. The other half was just a reappropriation. Just to give you an example, in New Mexico, how underfunded things are, we're getting, um, well, 73 cents of every dollar we're getting is roads and bridges. You can make a good argument that's not our, you know, that's out of proportion. But as somebody told me, the reason for that is because the highway contractors and the auto manufacturers have a disproportionate amount of influence. Uh, water infrastructure. We had a, a state engineer quit a year and a half ago because he says we, he didn't have the resource. He said he needed $2 billion for water infrastructure. We're only getting one third of that, $350 million from the, the Biden infrastructure bill. We're getting no money for uh, electric grid. We have the second sunniest state and the fifth windiest. So there's a lot of potential to produce uh, uh, renewables, and uh, we don't have the uh, the grid to transport that uh, that uh, electricity. Broadband, we need two billion dollars. We have 25% of our population that does not you can't afford or doesn't have access to broadband. We need two billion. Guess what? We only got 100 million dollars from one twentieth of what we need from the infrastructure bill. And um, it just goes on and on and on. The uh, we, we're talking to the choir here. We all, everybody on 
on listening on here realizes the importance of uh, infrastructure and the fact that it's uh, woefully uh, been underfunded. So uh, another interesting fact in uh, China, 8% of their GMP goes for infrastructure. In Europe, it's 5%. In the United States, it's 2%. Uh, again, that's obviously way short of, of the amount that we need to spend on infrastructure. So the lady uh, previously talked about turning the well, faucet on and not having any water. Well, if you're a real cynical person, you could say that the fact, you know, maybe the United States isn't going to get excited about doing something about water infrastructure until millions of people turn on the faucet and there's no water. Well, hopefully we don't get to that, to that extent. But anyway, that's uh, that's all I have. Uh, thanks for listening, and uh, very happy to join you uh, and help uh, promote and push this very necessary bill in Congress to create the National Infrastructure Bank. Thank you, and everyone have a great evening. Thank you so much, Senator Tallman. Really appreciate that. And, and I think one of the things that's really been driven home here this evening is the commonality of these issues across the country. So I'm sure that. Some of the things that Senator Tomlin was talking about, you see those in your hometown or your home state that those issues are facing you all also. I think what we will do is I'd like to um, uh, briefly scroll through um, some of the resolutions and the sign-on letters that we have circulating in other states. So I just want to assure everyone that we are working around the clock and around the country to raise awareness of the National Infrastructure Bank. So uh, Mark, can we show, uh, scroll through some of those slides? So, uh, oh, here's the resolution that Senator Lovelett was talking about. Well, they call it a memorial in Washington state. So uh, made it all the way through both houses of the legislature and to the governor's desk. So um, Washington state, we've got a really great group working there to push the legislation. Pennsylvania, we had Representative Cerisi on tonight. So we have uh, folks in Pennsylvania working hard on this. Ohio, we've got some Ohio folks here. We heard from uh, Representative Grimm. Next, uh, New Jersey. So we're doing a lot of work in New Jersey. We have been working in New Jersey for a couple of years now, raising awareness. And appreciate all our folks there. Uh, New Mexico, this is, uh, we just heard from Senator Tallman. And uh, Arizona, we hope to hear from Senator Diaz uh, still this evening. Alabama, so uh, that's a, uh, a red state, and but we are working in Alabama. They have multiple multiple issues that they're facing there. They're one of the poorest states in the country, and they definitely have a need for investment in infrastructure. Rhode Island, uh, oh New York, of course, the New York General Assembly. We've been working uh, very hard in New York, and we hope to have some exciting announcements coming uh, from uh, some of the legislators there soon. Uh, oh, it's just you know various, and essentially what we're doing in New York, and, and we may be doing this in your state, is going to major cities to uh, various um, uh, representatives and such. So we're uh, developing support wherever we can on a local basis or a statewide basis in these various states. Let's keep, oh. Um, so we also uh, have an op-ed that's going into the NASA Observer. And this is uh, another strategy that we've been using around the country. We've managed to get op-eds in some very important newspapers around the country. And we would love to run an op-ed in your local newspaper and we will even help you uh, write that op-ed. So if you're interested in doing that and submitting something to your local newspaper, just give uh, the coalition a shout. We'd be glad to help you with that. So now let's go, uh, let's see if, um, sent, well, okay, so now since we have this slide up, so the new House bill or the resolution is number 4052. So this was just reintroduced by Representative Danny Davis. We hope to um, have the same number or more of co-sponsors and would love to have the representatives from your state sign on and co-sponsor HR 4052. So you can see here, if you want to uh, call your member of Congress and urge them to support the bill, you can just take down that number 202-224-3121. 
uh, give your member of Congress a call and ask them to support HR 4052. And if you would like to schedule a meeting with your representative, we would be happy to do a Zoom call with one of the representatives or more uh, from your area. Just uh, send, a, send us an email, info at nibcoalition.com. So let's, um, let's give a, a call out to Senator Diaz and see if she is back on the call. Yes. Good is. evening, everyone. Um, Senator Diaz uh, from Arizona, good to be here with you all working on this important um, work. Uh, I'm Like I said, I'm from LD22 here in Arizona, which is uh, West Valley um, here in, in the Phoenix area. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, Arizona and how the National Infrastructure Bank will help Arizona. The Association of State Dam City Officials estimates that rehabilitation of non-federal dams in Arizona will cost 316 million based on 2012 data. Arizona's wastewater infrastructure experiences a 1.4 billion investment shortfall. 179,846 of renter households are extremely low income. 136,282, we have a shortage of rental homes that are affordable and available for extremely low income renters. Also, we have about 80% of extremely low income renter households with severe cost burden. 14.9% of Arizona residents are in poverty. 35% of the Native American population in Arizona is in poverty compared to other races in Arizona. Native Americans poverty percentage is very high. But with lack of households, reservations have large numbers of the homeless. Conditions of the few households are very poor. About a third of the Navajo housing doesn't have plumbing or working kitchen appliances. And 15% lack water. An estimated 90,000 Native Americans are underhoused or homeless. In Arizona, there are 132 bridges and over 3,100 and 93 miles of highway in poor condition. According to the White House, $2.2 billion in funding from law has been allocated to Arizona roads, bridges, road safety, and other major projects as of February. There are over 5 million licensed drivers in the state of Arizona, according to the Department of Transportation. According to TRIP, a national transportation research nonprofit, it's estimated that Arizona's deteriorated roads and bridges cost these drivers a total of $3.6 billion a year. The ASCE infrastructure report card grade is a C. Um, as you can see here, this includes uh, our roads, dams, levees, and um, drinking and wastewater infrastructure. Um, that are in poor condition. 32% of households lack high-speed broadband access. 20% of homes lack internet. Power grid needs expansion. Uh, we have a growing population, large landmass, 20-year drought. And then how are we going to, uh, what Arizona will receive from the NIB? Uh, up to 96 billion over 10 years, creating 480 thousand new family sustaining jobs so that will help our families um, this also will include Arizona's share of 400 billion dollars to deliver new water supplies one option is piping five percent of water from Hachafalaya to Colorado Lake Powell to ref refill two reservoirs in under two years and then uh, by existing at Aqueduct to Phoenix. Also, um, other benefits are uh, 
an enhancement of education to train workers in new industries, uh, to connect and improve our, our rural communities and improve state and city finances, business and tourism through economic growth. Uh, these are some of the things that the National Infrastructure Bank will help with here in our state. And I look forward to continuing the work on this bill. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Diaz. We really appreciate you being uh, with us here today. And, um, you know, certainly the drought in the Southwest and Arizona and the water level in the dams there that provides drinking water, not only to Phoenix, but to um, Los Angeles uh, is, should be a great concern to everybody in that area. Um, so that concludes our presentations for this evening. So at this time, I'd like to open it up for Q&A. And uh, so let's get those questions ready. If you want to raise your hand, I'll be calling on you. And I see uh, Timothy has had his hand up for a while. Timothy, do you have a question or a comment? Yes, I note that the GOP dominated states of Alabama and South Carolina have passed through at least one of their houses resolutions supporting the National Infrastructure Bank which implies that there are GOP legislatures in those states who support the NIB. Why don't we ask them to lobby GOP members of Congress to co-sponsor H.R. 4052, the new NIB bill, and will, and will NIB introducer Representative Danny Davis appear on TV talk shows to tout that bill? Good. Those are good questions. And my opinion is Danny Davis should be on a TV talk show because he can really deliver the message. But um, I'd like to maybe go to our coalition people and can you give us a little bit of an explanation on what we are doing in, in Alabama and South Carolina? I know that we are working uh, and calling on Republicans every single day to garner support. But anyone from the coalition have a, a comment on uh, to answer um, Tim's question? I can maybe uh, to say a little bit because um, I've been on a lot of the phone calls all around the country to get support for the National Infrastructure Bank. And the thing that really, really works well is getting those local legislators, like Timothy is mentioning, to uh, come on calls with their members of Congress to support uh, support the bill. This is a winning formula. And we've we've gotten a lot of support from Republicans, especially state Republican legislatures. The problem seems to be that at, at the congressional level, the Republicans are a little bit reluctant because of this infighting over the debt ceiling. And even though the NIB doesn't cost the budget anything, uh, they're still reluctant to sign on to a bill that has a $5 trillion price tag. But that is uh, a complement to the budget does not cost the budget anything, makes money for government, and it will be the way, the only way that we can get uh, all the infrastructure projects into every single congressional district, Republican or Democrat. Uh, there's no other way to do this because the House now has signaled that it is not willing to increase spending on anything, let alone on infrastructure. So this will be the only mechanism to do it. And what we need to do now, Timothy, is to have every single person on this call now call up your member of Congress and say, we, we've reintroduced 4052 and we need you to support it and come on board and co-sponsor this bill. That's what we need now. The grassroots effort is the thing that pushes these members of Congress. Thanks. It seems like the Republicans kind of move in a herd. So it's not enough to just get one in favor. We have to get like a group of them that will all sign up together to support the legislation. So we talk to one Republican and then we say, hey, who are your friends? Which other Republicans should we talk to? So we really are working on getting a group of them that are friends working together to help um, sponsor the legislation. So we're working really hard on that, Timothy, but um, very good comment. Thank you for bringing that up. So uh, I would like You're to uh, go to uh, Linda Tosti-Lane from Washington State. Linda? 
Hi, um, my question deals with the differences between the new bill 4052 and the previous versions. Uh, so it, what is, the, have there any, been any changes made and what are they? I, I wanna say that, you know, we've been taking input from folks around the country uh, and making some changes. So for example, the Buy American provisions, labor provisions. So we, you know, gladly accept that input and have made some changes, but maybe Alfeca, you could address that more uh, specifically in terms of what changes may have been made. Yes, uh, you're correct, uh, Julie, that uh, we did strengthen those provisions uh, based on comments from people that we've been talking with over the last couple of years. And we added, for example, um, inclusions of the Navajo Nation and strengthened uh, ways to get this uh, these pro funded projects uh, to low income uh, communities, those kinds of things. They were really minor changes. The bill still operates in the same way. It's still a $5 trillion bank to lend for infrastructure projects all across the country. And the other little tweak that we made was because the bipartisan infrastructure law, the infra the in Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, as it's, it's formerly known as, came out in the interval between the two bills. So we put in provisions so that there wouldn't be double counting or double financing of projects as between one bill and the other, uh, and be more coordination of infrastructure project rollout between those two bills as well. Thank you. Okay, uh, next we'll go to the great state of Ohio. We have Craig Swartz here with his hand raised. Craig, do you have a question or a comment? Yeah, it was just a general comment. Uh, I wanted to announce to the group that last night I was elected as the inaugural chair of the new Ohio Democratic Party Rural Caucus. And one of the first things that I'm going to be doing uh, in the near future is to have this broadcast to all of the members of the new Ohio Rural Caucus so that we can start taking these talking points to rural leaders and particularly Republican rural leaders who need to start hearing this message so they can start filtering up. This is something I've been talking about for a long time. And so being in this position now uh, is gonna enable me to travel around the state and get this broadcast, this message broadcast to all of Ohio. I wish Michelle was still on this call because now I've got a little bit more gravitas uh, to testify in front of the Ohio Chamber when we bring the Ohio resolution um, uh, up, for, uh, uh, up for debate. So at any rate, I'm very, very excited about uh, what we're going uh, with these developments uh, in light of also the economic news so we can be pushing these, you know, a lot of these ideas forward. And I'm really excited about going to Southern Ohio, particularly Appalachia, because what, what Senator Diaz was just talking about in terms of Arizona, what's going on there, are the same things we're encountering here in, in Ohio. The lack of infrastructure, lack of uh, low income housing, affordability, and getting that dis uh, distributed. And of course, with other speakers, we were talking about with mass transit. Of course, I've been a mass transit advocate all my life. And uh, and I've traveled here. I've lived abroad several times, lived in Europe, and we should be doing the same damn thing here. And we're long past way to do that. So uh, as new chair of the Rural Caucus, I'll be putting this forward and a two-pronged attack. As now as a chair, I will be uh, of the caucus for the ODP. I will be on the state central committee and I will be pushing this forward for the state party to adopt as a resolution as well. Hey, thank you, Craig, and congratulations on your position. I'm sure you'll be excellent at that. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Craig was recently a candidate for Congress in Ohio and spent months uh, slogging around. I don't know how many counties in Ohio, but he's been uh, putting in the mileage there. So uh, I think that'll be, a, uh, you'll be very effective in that role. Okay, uh, let's move on. We have uh, Glenn Rehang with his hand up. Glenn, do you have a comment or a question? Yeah, I, I have kind of a comment there. Uh, it, it, well, it's, it's a question based on uh, banking economics. On June 7th, the Intercept podcast had a program which talked to financier Frank Gustra, and he was discussing how the U.S. wars, sanctions, and policies are threatening the dollar's reserve currency dominance. 
And what caught my ear was that he mentioned that foreign countries are skipping the normal way commodities are bought, purchased between, for, between countries, which is using dollars to buy those commodities and going to using their own currency. He felt that this strategy might push governments to go back to commodities bank financing uh, like the gold standard that we used in this country. If he's right, how would it affect how would this affect the banking this banking scheme that we have, if at if at all? Okay, good question. We are going to go to our financial experts, Alfeca and Ellen. Okay, I can start, and then I'm sure Ellen will pick up because she knows these things intimately well as well. But uh, you're correct. The value of the U.S. dollar is always something that an economist keeps their eye on. And it moves up and down with our uh, trade deficit. Unfortunately, we used to be a country that exported more goods abroad than we bought. Uh, and so that's why the dollar strengthened and it was based on our manufacturing capability. But since 1970, all of that manufacturing has gone offshore and our trade deficit has switched around the other way. And the only thing that's holding it up is the banking system and, and people bringing in, buying dollars to invest in our stock market. That's uh, not real, real investment. That's just uh, financialization of things. And you are correct that, uh, that that's other countries are producing more, especially China. They are a world producer now. They are out producing us and they could take over as a reserve currency. And if that happens, then our economic situation in the United States would vastly deteriorate. How the NIB helps, it rebuilds American manufacturing base by creating a demand for American manufactured goods as a result of doing all this construction work in infrastructure. That's the secret, the same secret that was used by Alexander Hamilton and all the other previous banks. It's a winning formula and we can do it again. Ellen? I'm not sure I have too much to add. From what I've read, I, I think we're not losing reserve currency status because there really is no alternative. That, that has to do with the foreign exchange markets and we're bringing in we're getting more interest on our bonds etc than anyone else so they still want to invest in the united states and it shouldn't affect our banking system at all because that's you know an internal system so that's our internal dollars and we're leveraging credit which is all basically created by banks in the first place so I, it, to me it's not a big worry but yeah we definitely need to get our productivity up Thank you. That's um, Thank somewhat you. reassuring. <laughs> All right. Great. Um, okay. We've got more questions. Let's go with uh, Katie Watson. Katie, uh, you're from Ohio. Do you have a question or a comment for us? I have a comment that I want to tell Miss Alpaca about the Great Depression that she probably doesn't know or does know. My great ancestor is the great John Dillinger. When the bank was closed, they robbed it and gave it back to people before the bank reopened. So that's a real fact from the 1930s. That's great. Yeah, so. Using that strategy, but um, anyway, <laughs> thank thank you. Did you have another uh, question, or was that it? That was it. <laughs> okay, thanks, Katie. Appreciate that. Uh, okay, uh, Diane Foster, you've got your hand up. Okay, so I'm in Washington State, and Liz Lovett is my senator. Um, and I just I know we have a state uh, memorial. Uh, in the Senate, but what about the U.S. Senate? Is there a version of this there? We um, do not have one yet. However, we have been in very serious and significant conversations with multiple senators, including senators that have an R after their name. And uh, so we are very hopeful that there will be a resolution introduced into the Senate, um, we hope, this year. Oh, good. Anyone add, a, add anything to that or? We're working hard. And of course, if you wanted to call Maria Cantwell or um, the mom with tennis shoes. Uh, Murray. Murray. Yeah. Murray. 
you know, uh, please give them a call and, and, you know, tell them that you're a supporter and, and we would love to have them on board. You know, it'd be really, what I think would be really great, and I, I will just say that we recently had a meeting with the Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski from my home state, Alaska, and I would really love to see um, Lisa Murkowski, uh, you know, a strong, moderate Republican uh, senator, uh, hook up with somebody like Patty Murray or Maria Cantwell and have, uh, I mean, it may sound sexist, but to have a, a woman-backed um, bill uh, supporting infrastructure, I think that would be uh, really a great achievement. So please give um, your senators a call. And, you know, and that goes for everyone here on the call. Please call your senators and ask them to get behind uh, this legislation. I would like to uh, go to our action page. Uh, we've, you've heard us um, over the course of uh, this evening's conversation ask you multiple times to please call your uh, local representatives or your city assembly person or your state uh, legislators. We appreciate support from all of those quarters. Um, here again, you see our website. Um, we actually have some uh, handy dandy items that you can download, including a brochure that's downloadable so uh, that you would be able to um, uh, send to your local representative or your state legislator. So please visit our, our website. And do we have another, um, another page? And then uh, for more information, um, we are on Facebook, uh, you see the address there, we're on Twitter and you see our email address. So uh, we really appreciate your, your support. I do wanna say that we are a, a strictly grassroots organization and we exist uh, through the uh, generosity of all of the folks on the phone who support this legislation. So if you visit our website, please look for that donate button. And if you're so inclined, click on the donate and we appreciate all contributions they help fund our online um, uh, webinars, they fund our advertising that we do in national publications, and we so we really depend on your generosity. So with that, we will call this evening's uh, webinar to uh, a close. Thanks so much everyone for being here, we really appreciate it, and uh, get on our mailing list and be on the lookout for the next one. Thank mm -hmm. you.